and welcome to our uh, virtual Through the Lens program series uh, presented by the Colorado Snow Sports Museum. And we are honored and humbled that Dwayne, Dr. Dwayne Vandenbush has joined us tonight. Uh, Dwayne is the current Colorado State historian and um, has been a teacher at Western University uh, for over 62 years. Is that correct, Dwayne? Yeah, 59. 59. Okay, so I'm, yeah. Um, so there, every, there's so many former students in Eagle County. I love it. They always come into the museum. They're like, I know him. I took a class. So uh, we are honored that Dwayne is, is willing to give us time to his, to the museum. And um, last year or a couple of years ago when he came, it was incredible. Um, you spoke and you, I literally thought five minutes had gone by and it was an hour. Um, you're, you're just, you have so much knowledge in that head of yours. So I'm so grateful that you're willing to share that knowledge with our uh, Colorado Snow Sports Museum audience. So, um, yep. And if you are so inspired, please consider making a donation. I'm not going to ask again for a little while. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our current supporters. Thank you to Dwayne for giving your time. And um, thank you to the Town of Vale, Epic Promise, and Eve Productions, who has helped us produce this series this year. So um, Dwayne, I'm going to give the floor to you and I'm going to mute myself, but I'm going to stay here. And remember, if you have questions, you can ask them in the Q&A and um, or we will do a Q&A at the end of the program. So um, but yeah, so you can ask away or you can hold your questions till the end. So here you go, Dwayne. It's the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Jennifer Mason for all the work that she's done in putting this shindig together. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to give this presentation on the history of Colorado skiing for the Colorado Snow Sports Museum at Vail. Vail was the dream of two men named Earl Eaton and Pete Seibert, and along with men like Bob Parker and Sarge Brown a little later. It opened up in the winter of 1962 and 63, and I got a little personal story to tell about when Vail opened. I came up to Vail in January about 1963 with three of my students, one of whom skied with me on that day. And we got up early in the morning, got over to the lift and 12 inches of fresh snow had fallen. And I'm just kind of a beginning skier. I just started to learn how to ski. So it was kind of windy, kind of a blizzard. And if you can imagine that today, in January of 1963, one ski patrolman was ahead of us and we were the only two people there in line getting ready to get on the lift. So he rode up to the top and we couldn't see anything. It was just a real low visibility day. And I told Tim Duell, the uh, students uh, skiing with me, I said, Tim, the only thing I know to do is just follow that ski patrolman's tracks. And I was doing fantastic in powder snow, stem turn to the right, stem turned to the left, and then all at once I fell off the edge of a cliff. Well, it really wasn't the edge of a cliff, but that was my introduction to tourist trap. Today, and in days after when I became a better skier, my favorite run at Vail was Reaver Ridge and tourist trap. So that's the story of how things have changed over the course of about 60 years at Vail from the time it opened. Vail today is one of the great ski areas in the world, highlighted by the two greatest women alpine skiers in history, Lindsey Vaughn and Michaela Schifrin. The early ski areas of Colorado had boat toes and rope toes in the 1930s and 40s. Aspen, Winter Park, Wolf Creek, Monarch, Berthoud, and then during the winter of 39 and 40, Pioneer opened up in the Gunnison country with the first chairlift in Colorado history. Then after World War II came Walter Pepke and Aspen and Colorado was on its way. The great days of building ski areas were the 1960s with Vail and Crested Butte. And then a bit later with great areas like Telluride and Copper Mountain, Purgatory, Keystone and Beaver Creek. If any area in the U.S. was made for skiing, the Rocky Mountains of Colorado were. High mountains, 300 more inches of snow a year, champagne powder, and almost perpetual sunshine. The earliest skiing was done in the 1860s by missionaries, 
bringing religion to placer miners and early mining camps. Methodist missionary John Franklin Dyer skied from granite to California Gulch, later Leadville, and then into Minersville, a camp in the Gunnison country in the winter, a trip of over 50 miles. Father George Darley, a Presbyterian from Lake City, skied into Silverton and Animus Forks over almost 13,000 foot high passes like Engineer and Cinnamon. And both wrote about their travels later on. Dyer in the Snowshoe Itinerant and Darley in Pioneering in the San Juan. When gold and silver mines opened in Colorado in the 1870s, thousands of miners flocked into mining camps like Central City and Georgetown, Aspen on the Roaring Fork, the San Juan, the Gunnison Country, Breckenridge, and California Gulch. Many of the skiers were from Scandinavia and Canada, and they introduced the sport of snowshoeing or skiing. That's what they call skis at that time, snowshoeing. What we call snowshoes today were then called Canadian webs. Then skiing was the only way to get around in the winter. The skis were handmade by miners from spruce timber. The tips were boiled in camp kettles and then curled upward in racks. The skis were nine to 14 feet long, four and a half inches wide. They weighed eight pounds. They had a leather toe piece that you stuck your mining boot into. They had a four inch block of wood for a heel piece. Your foot could go up, but it couldn't go back. And then they put beeswax or dope on the bottom of the skis. And everybody had a guide pole seven to nine feet long. That was used as a support and a brake and also to help pull forward. The only way to turn was the telemark turn, but in reality, there was very little turning. To avoid smashing into boulders or trees, the skier often had to leap off the skis into over the head snow. And the skis were stopped from going into oblivion by lanyards or leather tied to the skier's belt. During the mining boom in Colorado, tour races were held between mining camps on weekends, it was up to $100 in first prize, more than a miner might make in weeks. The races were held at Central City, Aspen, Breckenridge, Silverton, Telluride, and in the Gunnison country. One of the greatest and most publicized races was on Washington's birthday in 1886 in Crested Butte a very steep Gibson Ridge above town. A special train from Gunnison brought a thousand people in to watch down below, and they were drinking and betting on their favorites. The slope off Gibson Ridge, 525 yards long, 35 degrees, no slope preparation. The first one down one, and everybody went straight down. Heats were run. And then four men, the winner of heats, went into the finals. And four men stood on top of Gibson Ridge on that day, February the 22nd, 1886, and awaited a rifle shot to come down. Two were mining engineers from a nearby mining camp called Irwin, Harry Cornwell and Al Fish. One was a guy named Al Johnson, who was known then as the champion snowshoer of the Rocky Mountains who had rarely been beaten in any of the tour races, and who would carry the mail for many years between Crested Butte and the town of Crystal, braving avalanches as he went through Crystal Canyon and through a place called the Devil's Punch Bowl. And then the final man was a young boy, 16 years old, named Charlie Bainey from Crested Butte. And the newspaper account said that he had been fairly raised on snowshoes. The newspaper said that both Bainey and Johnson had perfect shoes, smooth as glass, and they glistened. A rifle shot sent the four men down the 35 degree slope. Cornwall and Fish fell early and were out of the race. Charlie Bainey and Al Johnson raced down that track 15 feet from each other when the newspaper said Charlie Bainey doubled himself up on his shoes and shot down the mountain like a speeding bullet. Maybe the first racing tuck in history. Al Johnson's mother didn't raise a dumb kid. And Al Johnson doubled himself on his shoes and came after Charlie Bainey. And as they flashed into the bottom, 
and into the flats at an estimated speed of 60 miles an hour. Al Johnson had been beaten for one of the first times in his life by 18 inches. The newspaper said the race was one of the most exciting ever seen in the Rockies, and we doubt if its equal has occurred anywhere. And then all the people paid off their bets, adjourned into the saloons of Crested Butte, and more drinking and polka dancing took place. The Silver Panic of 1893 meant the collapse of mining camps. People left, smelters shut down, railroads stopped running, mines shut, and skiing began to fade. The good times, as they say, were all gone and were bound for moving on. And then the locals who remained kept skiing alive. Some took trains to get where they wanted to ski and some just skied locally on nearby hills. Families, rich families from Denver took the train through the Moffat Tunnel and they used construction cabins used by workers on the Moffat Tunnel and they began to ski in an area on the Western Slope that soon was called Winter Park. Skiing then also came on Berthoud Pass and Steamboat Springs with the legendary Carl Howelson. During the winter of 1939 and 40, Winter Park, Wolf Creek, Monarch, and Pioneer in the Gunnison country opened with lifts and then came Aspen after World War II and skiing had made a comeback. Walter Pepke was one of the guys who really got skiing going with Aspen in the late 40s and the early 50s. And now with that background, we go to the pictures. And here we go to picture number one, and I'm gonna comment them as we go through. There's a picture of a typical placer miner with his uh, burrow loaded up with his equipment and ready to go in the 1860s. Next. The guy in front on the right is Al Johnson skiing at Irwin, a nearby mining camp, and you can get a good look at how long those skis were, and you can see the guide poles. And the little boy in the middle looks like he's got a branch as a guide pole. Next. At Squaw Valley every year, even today, they have races using the old skis. Now just imagine trying to turn those skis. Only way you're going is going downhill. Next. There is one of the tour races. This one's at Crested Butte in 1883. Unprepared snow, guide pole, coming down the bottom of the hill and then into the flats. Next. Another shot of Al Johnson on the right. One of the great skiers, the champion snowshoer of the Rocky Mountains. Next. There is the Crystal Snowshoe Club. Crystal not far from Marble and Carbondale and Redstone, a great silver camp early. That's where Al Johnson had a post office, was postmaster and had a store and also carried the mail. And you can see that both men and women skied. Next. Little Girl at Marble, 196. Long skis, tough bindings. She's probably not going very far. Next. Little Boy up Ohio Creek in the Gunnison country, 198. You can see that dog is bored stiff. That kid isn't going anywhere. It hasn't gone very far. Next. There are a couple of skiers outside of Animus Forks in 1908. And again, you can see the length of those skis and the tips were put in the camp kettles and boiled so they'd come up. Next. Crested Butte Ski Club, 1886. They had uniforms, they had little ties. And they were very proud, and you can see that leather toe piece that you stuck your mining boot in. Next. There is Gunnison and the Levita Hotel in the background. One of the premier hotels in Western Colorado. Built in 1884, 
$250,000, four and a half stories high, teak and mahogany, gold lace, crystal chandeliers, and one person traveling through Gunnison at that time called it a peacock among mud hens. Next. There are people skiing where an avalanche ran the previous day at Crystal. The feeling was that if the avalanche had already run, it wouldn't run again. Well, they might have been mistaken, but they lucked out. Next. There are a group of skiers in Crested Butte with a coffin in the background and they're taking it to a blockhouse where it'll be stored in the winter until the ground thaws in the spring or early summer, and then it'll be buried. Next. There are Mr. and Mrs. Carl Bergman outside of Crested Butte. And you can see Mrs. Bergman with the skis that are probably double her size, at least 10 to 12 feet high. Next. Animus Forks, Colorado, 1913 above Silverton. So much snow that year that telegraph wires were covered up with snow. Next. That is how the miners got to and from the mills and the mine. They hopped in those ore buckets and rode up to the mine and then at the end of the day, they'd ride it down to the mill. One day in Silverton, in the 1890s, power went out and two men in the ore bucket had a chance of either jumping 300 feet, which was sure death or staying in the ore bucket and the power did not get restored and they froze to death in the ore bucket. Next. This is as far as the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad ever ran in the Gunnison country to the north. And that is the anthracite coal breaker, one of the few anthracite coal mines in Colorado. The biggest coal breaker in 1883, west of Connellsville, Pennsylvania. And you can see the tram running up towards the mine. And it was a gravity tram with the empty coal cars coming down, pulling the empty coal cars going up. Next. There's the water tank and the railroad. You can see the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad engine at Crested Butte in the 1880s. The railroads, the narrow gauge was very slow, averaging about nine miles an hour. And they said on time, any time. And you didn't want it to run over you because it was on you for so long. Next, 1907, I'll read the, uh, Writing on the left, ready to start snowshoeing. This is before, as I have labeled. I wish I had a picture of after. You would not have recognized them as the same company. You can, they must have been a tough day. Next, shooting rabbits right outside of the railroad station in Gunnison, 1924. Next. This is a great picture because this is Steamboat Springs, 1920. See Howlson Hill there kind of in the background on the left. And it's a unique picture because the three ladies on the right have guide poles and the lady on the left has got two poles with baskets. As Bob Dylan would say, the times they were a changing. Next. Crested Butte. Chicken ranch. This is how locals skied in the 1930s. You walked up on hills and then skied down. And you can see that they made a little jump on the right. And you can see there were no turns either. You just went up and came straight down. Next. This is a famous photo, February 13th, 1938, on top of Marshall Pass which is an adjacent pass to Monarch. And there, a ski special took 407 skiers from the Salida Winter Sports Club up to the top of the pass, 
107 came from the Gunnison Sports Club, and 122 rode the regular train. And they all got together on top of Marshall Pass. Willie the Porter played the accordion and dancing came. Count Dupuy of Belgium and Thor Groswald of Winter Park gave lessons. A lot of drinking and tobogganing went on. And you could ski down to the Chavano switch five miles down. And then the train would pick you up and take you back to the top for a dime. First chairlift. And on that day, many people dreamed of a day when you might have a ski area and lifts. Next, Vail Pass. And I want all you people at Vail to get a good look at it. I'll bet you didn't know that Vail Pass was between Salida and Gunnison. That photo lasted, that sign lasted for about a week. The guy who built the highway was the highway commissioner. He was in charge of building in 1939, Charlie Vail. Very arrogant, very self-centered, and he wanted to change the name of Monarch Pass to Vail Pass. But the local people put an S on the end of Vail, dropped the P from Pass, so it read Vail's ass. And they threw the sign into a ditch. And after a week, Charlie Vail gave up. And Monarch got the name that it always had. But Vail got even, as you people know, and he got the pass between Copper and Vail name for him a little later on. Next, there is a lady skiing off of Monarch Pass in 1924, long before there was any lift or ski area. Next, there is a group of people skiing on January the 1st in the 1930s on Maroon Lake, just above Aspen. Now, one of my favorite hikes is Crested Butte to Aspen via East Maroon Pass. You go right by Maroon Lake, and that's a great photo. And they had a, a guy playing the accordion and drinks, and it was fantastic. Next, this is a lady with her son in a snowdrift box mounted on top of a sled, and she is going to ski from a mining camp called White Pine to the railhead at Sargent's just below Monarch Pass, 10 miles. Next. There is the most famous run at Monarch, and a lift ran halfway up that. It runs all the way to the top now, and that is called the Gun Barrel. Next. Now the next five photos are gonna be photos of the greatest skier who maybe ever existed in Colorado. This is an 18 year old Gunnison boy named Carl Easterly, graduated 1938. And on Quicks Hill, which you had to walk up about eight miles south of Crested Butte, Carl Easterly built a little jump and he began to do backflips long before Stein Erickson or anybody else was doing them after World War II. Next, 1946, he has been hired by a TV program, very early one, called You Ask For It. And you can see all the photographers on the right watching he and his brother Verl being pulled by an ancient helicopter at 50 miles an hour. They're going to jump that wooden fence and do a backflip. Next. Verl falls, Carl doesn't. He is now going to ski over a 75 yard lake at 50 miles an hour on Alpine skis. Next. He makes it. Next. And he now does another backflip over another wooden fence. Now, whenever I showed this, and I hope I'll go back to that one. Whenever I show this, I always tell the people that Carl Easterly was a great friend and he lived at Silverthorne until the age of 94 when he passed away about four years ago. 
And I always told people whenever I show this photo, series of photos, let's give a round of applause for the best there ever was. And I'd call Carl the next morning and I'd say, Carl, you got a standing ovation again for the best there ever was. And he loved it. Next. There are skiers at the Camp Bird Mine above Uray skiing around 1910. Next. This is Quicks Hill where Easterly built that jump south of Crested Butte. This is a guy named Carl Brand, uh, Fred Brand, 1932. The guy who took that photo had to have a good camera because Fred is going 35 miles an hour. He's on the rise. He is scared. The guys in back of him are scared. And Carl is wearing a flying helmet. And he always told me everybody was afraid of that jump, but you didn't want to be chicken, so you went off of it. Next. Pioneer Ski Area, Cement Creek, eight miles from Crested Butte, winter 1939-40. The warming house on the left, people lining up to ski and ride the first chairlift in Colorado history. Next. There's the lift going a very steep slope, and the lift was called the Comet. Next, there is the modern chair made by locals in their garage. Now, the ski patrol, or the uh, Forest Service took a look at this in the fall, and they said, too high. Anybody falls out they're going to get killed. Lower those chairs. And then 25 feet of snow fell. And people were getting flipped out of the chairs because their knees were up under their chins. And the Forest Service said, you guys got to lower those or raise those chairs because it's dangerous. Next. That's how steep it was with everything a fall away turn. And that's Crested Butte Mountain in the background. I mean, that's very steep for the kind of equipment they had then. Next. Rosman Hill, used by the Western States ski team, started winter 1951 and 52. Pioneer got too dangerous and closed. And there are the, the judges on the jumping stand. And you can see the slalom set up. And that's Highway 135 in the background. And cars are all lined up all the way to Highway 135. Next bringing in an injured skier by locals. There were no ski patrol at that time with Crested Butte Mountain in the background, Rosman Hill. Next. 10th Mountain Ski Division, training at Camp Hale, the old mining camp of Pando, right off Tennessee Pass. Next. Featured in the Saturday Evening Post. 1942, next, on maneuvers, Resolution Bowl. The federal government spent $128 million for the barracks and 14,300 men trained there. 900 died in the mountains of Italy. Some of the guys who survived were Pete Seibert and Steve Knowlton and Bob Parker, and Larry Jump, some of the legendary guys who came back and started ski areas later on. Next. And there's Camp Hale. Now, when these guys got a furlough, they would go to Aspen and they would ski on the Hotel Jerome, uh, sleep on the floor of the Hotel Jerome and ride the boat tow which carried eight skiers powered by a car wheel 500 yards up on top of Ajax Mountain. They drank a drink that kept them warm, a thick chocolate malt shake spiked with seven shots of bourbon. When they drank that, they never got cold. And they also had a song that they sang, their systems and theories of skiing. But one thing I surely have found, the skiing's just good in the winter, but the drinking's good all year around. 
Next. Genesee Mountain outside of Denver, 1920s. Get a load of those cars, those Model A's and Model T's in the background. Now they never had very much snow, but they had enough this year to at least come off the jump. Next. Howelson Hill, Steamboat Springs, named for the great Carl Howelson. Next. Berthet Pass, 1930s. Walk up, ski down. Later on, got a rope tow. Next. Winter Park Rope Tow, 1941. Next. Ski train, dropping people off at Winter Park, leaving Union Station early in the morning, going through the six mile long Moffat Tunnel and dropping people off at Winter Park where they would ski for the rest of the day, then board the train and come back to Union Station. Still runs today. Next. Dick Durrance, legendary guy at Aspen accepting the Harriman Cup, Sun Valley, Idaho, 1936. Mrs. W. Averill Harriman giving him the cup. Harriman was the guy who started Sun Valley because he owned the Union Pacific Railroad that ran right by there. Now I had a chance to ski with Dick Durrance when he was uh, late 70s at the Legends of Skiing and Telluride, 1971. And he skied with his skis about 18 inches apart. And you'd have to have a stick of dynamite to knock him off his skis. Next. Aspen, Colorado, 1948. Mill and Main Street. Next. The FIS World Championships, Aspen, 1951. Norwegian ski team and the Swedish ski team and the US ski team lined up. That really made Aspen into an international resort when the FIS championships were held there in 51. Next. There is a race at Aspen on Little Nell. And you can see that there are city blocks in Aspen in the early 1950s with nothing on them. Next, chair one, Aspen, which I've ridden. One person chair, blanket over your legs to keep you warm in the morning. And if you look down below, you get a clear picture. Blocks, nothing there. You could have bought the whole block for $5,000. Now you got to pay a little more. Now I skied Aspen in the early 60s. And if you showed your driver's license and it had a Western Slope address, the ticket was $5. If you didn't, it was six. And now they tell me it's a little more than that. Next. This is the Rosman Hill Jump. You see the big W, big collegiate races were held there and one guy's coming off the jump. Next, Sven Wick, the Western States ski coach and United States Olympic coach at Squaw Valley, taking his ski team in the wintertime from Crested Butte to Aspen over 13,000 foot high Conundrum Pass and then dropping down into Aspen. Next, this is the Western States ski team 1971 going over East Maroon Pass, and then dropping down to Maroon Lake in Aspen. Next. The Western State Weenie Wagon has run out of gas near Winter Park. And there's Sven Wick and his skiers pushing it into Winter Park. <laughs> Next. Western State Ski Team 1954. Now Sven Wick is on the left. And if you uh, look over his right shoulder, it says, tow tickets, $1. Next. Crested Butte, 
Christmas Eve, 1951. Next. This guy is Steve Krismanich, skiing on Pershing Mine Hill, built for local kids just outside of Crested Butte. Now, I've always thought, you look at those heavy baskets, the, the big skis with bad bindings, that is one hell of a turn. Next. Jumping off the Pershing Mine Hill, early 1950s. Next. Jumping off Pershing Mine Hill again. Little kids were jumping off a 20 meter jump. That's how they learned how to ski. Next. This is the Crested Butte Ski Area, 1948, when it was the Malensic Ranch and nothing there. Next, the beer stube, which was the Malensic brothers who had the ranch. It was their home in the summertime as they ranched. And I spent many a moment after skiing at the beer stube, where I always said the beer was cold, the women were all good looking, and the music was very good. Next. Jumping off one of the barns. Next. Crested Butte Ski Area when it opened up during the winter of 61, 62. The warming house, which is still being built, J Bar building in the background. Next. Now they got the Italian gondola. Crested Butte and Vale were the two ones that had the first gondolas. Three people in the gondola. And the old Italian tradition said, you bless the gondola, which Father Leo McKenna did. And then the gondola broke down for the rest of the day. And Father McKenna, going to the parking lot, slipped and fractured his kneecap. When I visited him in the hospital, I said, Father McKenna, I've been a pretty good Catholic my whole life, but after your performance today, I'm thinking of switching. Next. Buddy Werner skiing on Rosman Hill, bamboo poles, one of the great alpine skiers in American history, if not the greatest. The only American ever to win the Hahnenkamm at Kitzbühel, Austria. He did it at the age of 21 in 1958. Darren Rolves won the only other American to win it, but he won it when they didn't have a lot of snow and it was only halfway. Now they always say when you win at Kitzbühel, you will never again buy another drink or another meal in all of Austria. Buddy Werner unfortunately killed in an avalanche, Valseline, Switzerland, right after the Olympic games of 1964. They brought him home, buried him in steamboat, changed the name of the mountain from Snow Mountain to Mount Werner what it is today. When everybody went back to Europe, all of his friends, and they were many, from every different country, wanted desperately to get a gift from Buddy Werner, a cowboy hat. And he was known as a Steamboat Springs cowboy, a legendary skier. Next. There's Vale. Opening up December 1962. Next. There is Pete Seibert, who with Earl Eaton took seven hours to walk up where the top of the bowls are today. And then when they brought Pepe Gramshammer with them a, a little later, he said it took forever, which is one of the names of the bag bowls at Vale today. Next. There is President Ford, who had a home in Vail and loved skiing there. A Michigan man. That's where I came from. I had a chance to shake hands with President Ford one time in Durango. Next. There is the gondola at Vail. And as all of you know, that terrible accident there that killed four people. And that's one of the ski patrolmen going to work and trying to get people off. Next. 
And there's the clock tower with Alpen Glow in the background. Vail, one of the most beautiful world-class ski areas in the world. Next. There is one of the uh, men coming down. I think this is a hot dog contest at Vail in the 1970s. And you can see it's a pretty big crowd down below. I don't know what run that is. Next. There's Sarge Brown, an old military man who brought some real discipline <laughs> to Vail in the early days. Pete Seibert and Bob Parker wanted him in there. Next. And that's the same shot we showed before. I'm sorry, we can pass that up. There is Gretchen Frazier, gold medal winner, Olympic Games, United States, 1948. And this is off a poster at Sun Valley and a guy playing the accordion in the background. Next. There is the United States ski team. And that is taken at Vail. And in the third row from the bottom, Second from the left is Dave Gorsuch, Gorsuch Limited, a good friend. Right in front of him is Linda Myers, another good friend, who also married one of my colleagues at Western. They live in Bayfield now, Linda and Frank Tukalski. Next, that is the Olympic team of 60. That's Vail before there was Vail. That's the Gore Valley. Next. There's Vail today. Next. Crested Butte, winter 61 62. Heavy snow. St. Patrick's Church in the background. Next. Four o'clock any afternoon in the mountains of Colorado. If Benjamin Franklin had been flying a kite with a little metal tip on the end, He'd have been electrocuted with that blast. Next. Oh, wow point between Lake City and Silverton. Now, you got to show your Western Slope driver's license if you want to proceed beyond that point, because as you can see, the road drops away a little. And of course, I'm just kidding. Next. Avalanche, not blown by guns. Natural avalanche, Telluride. Bridal Veil Falls area, 1970s. Next. Monument, right high above Crested Butte with Mount Crested Butte area down below, 1974. Next. This is Ingemar Stenmark in Europe, 92 World Cup victories, the most World Cup victories of any man or woman ever. Lindsey Vaughn was hot on his heels, though. And Michaela Schifrin is coming up fast on the outside. Next, Karl Schranz of Austria, Kitzbühel, 19, late 1960s the great rival of Jean-Claude Keeley. Next, Flying Bambini Brothers, Crested Butte, 1974. 10 young men coming off a steep jump, holding hands, doing a backflip, and landing and still holding hands. Next, Crested Butte, January, December 31, 1968, Warming House. I walked out of there with the polka music going hot and heavy, got lucky, took a picture of it. Next, that's the final picture. That is Crested Butte with the Elk Mountains in the background. One of my favorite shots. That is it, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure, be happy to answer any questions. I'll turn it over to Jim. 
Hi, thank you so much, Dwayne. Um, that was awesome. Um, yeah, I love the commentary. Um, I have a question. Um, that hotel, the Crystal Hotel, did that? Is that still in Crested Butte? Uh, no, the, the the there's no Crystal Hotel. The La Vida was the one oh, in Gunnison. Yeah, no, that's been. Uh, it was torn down to one story for the war effort in 43, and now there are a bunch of condominiums there, unfortunately. Uh, oh, okay. So we do have um, have a question uh, from Adrian that is, uh, do we have any info on the Colorado Alberg Club? Yeah, the Alberg Club dates back around the turn of the century, and the Phipps family was a member of the Alberg Club when they skied at Winter Park. But the Allberg Club really dates back even before the turn of the century. And it involved all the people who walked up on top and then skied down. Very early ski club. Cool. So, um, yeah, so I think we've got a couple more questions coming in. I can see people that are asking them now. You bet. Uh, just give us one second, Dwayne, as they come in. And yeah, they can go to the chat board too if they want, I think, Jim. Yes, they can. So can you see the chat board? I can. Okay. So people, you can, uh, yeah, go ahead, ask your questions to Dwayne in the chat or, um, I can't see it. Yeah. What is that? Ski jumping. Oh, was there ever ski jumping in Dillon? In, in, not, not that I know of in Dillon, and I, I come from ski uh, jumping country in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Now, they may be off of uh, artificial hills, but Steamboat was a big one. Crested Butte was a big one. So there were a number of areas, but Steamboat is kind of the gold standard. Okay, got it. Uh, Kim Langmaid is asking, uh, do you have any more information on Charlie Vale's personality? You just kind of touched on it. Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> Charlie Vale didn't get along with very many people. He was very accomplished as a highway commissioner, but he got into a lot of trouble with uh, Governor Ed Johnson. Then later on with Governor Ralph Carr, he was very opinionated and he didn't listen to a lot of people and what he wanted to do he wanted to do. And most of the time he was right, but some of the time he was wrong. So very arrogant, very opinionated, not a very nice person. Um, okay, we have another question coming in uh, from Jim uh, McMaster. Uh, the Denver Public Library uh, has lots of great resources about the Albert Club, whoever wants to know. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, thank said you. The first, first bylaws of the Albert Club was 1929. Okay. Just on the chat. Uh, so thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Yes, this is great. And then also, um, oh, I had a question and now I forgot it. Oh. Oh, Dwayne, do you have any information? We get asked a lot about uh, the Denver uh, 1976 Olympics and the bid that happened. Yes. What, do you, can, can, what can you elaborate on that? We do get asked that quite a bit. Yeah, I remember that very well. Uh, that was a referendum put before the, uh, before the Colorado people in 1972. And a representative from Colorado named Richard Lamb led the move against it. And later on, Dick Lamb became a three-term Colorado governor. And it wasn't very well thought out because one of the Alpine areas they had was at a place called Mount Snitkow, which is uh, on the way towards Loveland Pass on off of I-70 where the wind blew all the time. And this primarily was a promotion done by, uh, you know, hotel operators, airlines, and it probably would have cost the people of Colorado a lot of money. And, you know, it, it probably just wasn't very thought out in 1972. And it lost in the referendum three to two, the people of Colorado voted it down. 
So I don't think, I think the IOC has now protecting themselves so that that doesn't happen anymore. So we have another question. Uh, so uh, Kim Langmaid actually has another question about, and I was wondering this too, um, the defunct uh, chairlift in Marble, Colorado. I know that there was a, there was a, it looks like for two years, there was a, a ski resort yeah. in Marble. Yeah. Uh, that one came in the early seventies. I'm probably one of the only guys in history that ever wrote it. And it was a big promotion. They were going to have all kinds of planned unit developments in the marble area. And they built that ski area right on some of the worst avalanche and mud flow areas in the world. And eventually the Forest Service just said no. So it really, it never really operated. It operated for investors. And I was very fortunate because I was working on a history. I'd already done a history of marble. So they let me ride up. So cool. Uh, Dwayne, do you have any information about Meadow Mountain that's just locally here and um, that's right by right outside of Vale? You know, I, I don't, Jen, so I can't. Yeah, I know. I didn't that. know. It's we have some information, but not a lot on it. We do get yeah. asked a few times about that. And then um, and also you had mentioned something. Um, what was the what was the first chairlift again that was in Colorado? It was called was it? Pioneer Ski Area, three miles up Cement Creek, on the flank of Italian Mountain in the Gunnison Country, about eight miles south of Crested Butte. Okay, and what year was that? Nineteen thirty-nine forty, the winter of thirty-nine forty. And then, what year did Aspen? What was their first chairlift installed? Do you know that? Well, they had the boat tow back in 1938. that went 500 yards up the uh, side of uh, Ajax Mountain. And then Walter Pepke came in, and I think Chair One came in in 1947. And how long did that chair run? You know, I don't remember. It was still okay. operating in the middle 60s. And then, you know, so shortly thereafter, I think they took it out because it's too bad because it was a great chairlift, but it was inefficient, obviously, only carrying one person. Right. We actually have on display a uh, one of one chair of chair one from Aspen with the blanket and everything. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. No, it's awesome. Uh, Pete Feishman has a question. Um, and it says, didn't. Didn't ex-Governor Roy Romer um, own the Geneva Basin ski area over Guanella Pass from Georgetown? Is that correct? I, I think that he was invested in it. I don't know if he owned it, but he was one of the major investors. Okay, interesting. And then another question is, what? Um, why? Why was Crested Butte? And the Gunnison area so prominent in the early days of skiing? Because of two reasons, maybe more. Number one, it was great silver camps opened up, so thousands of miners came in. The Gunnison country had 25 to 40,000 people in 1882, and that's about double what we have today. And then secondly, the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad ran into Crested Butte because of the coal mine. So I'd say those were the two major reasons. And then, of course, the, uh, the mountains nearby were fantastic for skiing. Right, right, right. So I think um, I'll give people a few more minutes to ask any more questions. I can put them in the Q&A. Um, you know, we're answering them as quickly as we can. Um, Thank you to everyone who uh, is here and participated. And Dwayne, thank you so much for your time today. Um, your knowledge is vast. And um, I definitely hope that next year um, we can have you live and in person in the museum because that's way more fun. And then you yeah, can thank you Dale. very much for all of your work. And it was an absolute pleasure for me to talk for uh, the Colorado Snow Sports Museum in Vail. Yes, we, we are fortunate. The museum is still open. Uh, we're open daily from 11 to 6. And uh, in the month of March, we're open 11 to 8, uh, Thursday, 
Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So we're trying to give people something to do in the evenings while they're strolling around after dinner. Um, so it looks like we might have one more question that just came in and maybe that's it, or maybe I'm making it up. Nope, we've got another one that came in. Oh, poor Dave lost the oh we had someone that lost their sound. Uh, sorry, Dave. Uh, we are gonna record this or we did record this and we will put it up on our website. So Dave, you will be able to uh, watch this again. And um, yeah, so I think that, um, I think we're good. I think we're gonna wrap this sucker up. So have a great, uh, go get a whiskey, go get a beer. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Dwayne, for your time. And thank Thanks, you to Jim. everyone who, thank you to everyone who donated. And if you appreciated and love this, uh, please consider a donation. So thank you. Thank you, Dwayne.